Thank you very much. We spray our pastures, I'm going to say quite a bit and let you decide how much that is. I don't want to live on a tractor spraying anything. I'd much rather get by without it because it takes time and it takes diesel fuel and it takes money to spray. The best way to get good grass, I think, is to move your cattle in an appropriate manner and the grass will come on. But what we found a few years ago is that by spraying raw milk, you can really get a tremendous boost in your grass production. And what we, what we learned from this raw milk is that it, it helped our grazing in that it gave us more grass and so we are able to graze better in that we can knock the grass to the ground, uh, cover our soil, give the microbes more to eat, and so on. I, I think our grass is considerably better since we started spraying. Uh, and, and the first time we sprayed was in May of 2010. Uh, having said that, we didn't spray at all this year until September. We probably wouldn't have sprayed any had, it, had we not had a terrible drought. The drought, you know, as I'm sure most of you experienced it also, it devastated our grass and we thought, well, we'd try to give our grass a little bit of a boost. And I'll show you a picture. I, I, we've never had better looking grass than we've got right now. Now, we don't have as much of it as I'd like. And it's not as good in, in the sense of the bricks level, the sugar content. But it sure looks good. It's, it looks so good you'd want to cut it and put it on your salad. But we'll show you a picture of that later. Uh, the young man here operating the PowerPoint is Brandon Meebrewer. He's a young man from our county. He gets his master's degree in, a, in a less than 30 days from Lincoln University. He's helped us for a year and a half, does a great job. Um, Brandon does a lot of the spraying, and he does all of the work on the PowerPoint. Uh, I can, believe it or not, I can barely turn on a television. I am technologically challenged from the word go. But anyway, we've got some slides to show you today that I think you'll find interesting. The first thing we're going to show you is the, uh, the sprayer that we use to spray raw milk and the other products that we put on our field. Do we need to cut down the lights or is this be okay? All right. This is Brandon, and uh, this is a, a mist sprayer. They're sold in uh, Nebraska, I believe, is where they're manufactured. Uh, you'll get a better, oh, okay. This will actually cover an 80 to 100 foot swath on a, on a, uh, on a good day with, without much wind. One reason we did not do much spraying earlier in the year as we had so much wind it was unbelievable you just you just couldn't control the uh, the material you were spraying uh, but 80 to 100 feet you can get over a field pretty fast and uh, you're moving at about five and a half to six miles an hour uh, everything's calibrated for that this sprayer only puts on four gallons per acre of, of liquid so you don't have a lot of liquid to put on. Most boom sprayers have what they call 20 gallon nozzles. So you're putting 20 gallons of liquid on your field. If you're putting on two gallons of milk and that's all, then you've got 18 gallons of water hitting your field as well. If you want to add some molasses, put a half a gallon of molasses per acre and you're going to cover 10 acres, then you've got, you know, you've got five gallons of molasses in your tank and so on. But anyway, um, this sprayer is great for getting over fields in a hurry. The, the, uh, the, the, the drawback to it is if you got much wind, it's, it's, it's really not nearly as good as the boom sprayer. And you don't put quite as much liquid on your soil, which I think is probably a plus. Uh, I will show you the first thing we did when we sprayed, and this would have been about two and a half years ago in... Uh, May of 2010, let's hit that second slide. 
this is a field that we call the apple orchard. Uh, you can see in the bottom left-hand corner a, a, a water hydrant. There's another one down at the end of the red line, and that pretty well divides the field in half. What we did, we drove to the right of the hydrants and hit everything on the left side of that with raw milk. Two gallons of raw milk per acre, nothing else. No sea salt, no molasses, no nothing. Just raw milk. 28 days later, we hosted a field day, and a gentleman by the name of Terry Gompert, who's a very, very, who, who, I should say who was a very, very well-known uh, extension agent from Nebraska, came, and he could see what was going on. He could look at that field and say, oh my goodness, you got a lot of results. I couldn't see it. But he actually then went out and measured and where we had sprayed the milk, we had an extra 700 pounds of grass on a dry matter basis in uh, 28 days. Why don't you hit that third slide, Brandon? Okay, in, uh, in, in less than 30 days, we had 700 pounds of grass. And th the most amazing thing of all is the reduction in compaction. Where we sprayed the milk, it took 100 pounds of pressure per square inch to put a penetrometer in the ground. For those of you that don't know what a penetrometer is, it's a 28, tw I'm sorry, a 26, I was right the first time, 28 inch steel rod and it's the, the, the modern ones have dials on them so you know exactly how much pressure you're applying to get into the ground. Well, the one we had from University of Nebraska showed pounds per square inch and where we'd spray the milk, it took 100 pounds. To the right of the line that you saw a moment ago, it took 300 pounds of pressure to put that penetrometer into the ground. As I told you, I'm technologically challenged. I couldn't operate the thing and look at all the bells and whistles that told me the pounds per square inch. But all you had to do was take it and stick it in the ground, and where you had sprayed the milk, it just went right in. Where you didn't, you had to really put a lot of weight on it. So there's no, com no comparison uh, between the, the soil that was sprayed with the milk and that that did not get sprayed with milk. In Nebraska, they ran a test similar to the one that I conducted uh, two and a half years ago, but they did theirs in 2004. They sprayed two, five, 10, and 20 gallons of raw milk per acre. What they learned was two gallons per acre does just as much good as 20 gallons an acre. You're just wasting 18 gallons of milk per acre if you choose to put 20 on. The, uh, in Nebraska, they waited 45 days before they measured their grass, and in 45 days, they got 1,200 pounds of growth per acre. I think that's probably consistent with what we had because I told you at, at 28 days, we had the 700 pounds, but I went back to that same field about two and a half weeks later, and you could see where we sprayed the milk was at least six or eight inches taller than where we didn't spray the milk. So I'm, I'm thinking we clearly had more growth than we did 30 days, 15 days before that. Um, as the summer wore on, you could clearly see where we had sprayed the milk. Tremendous weed control. Uh, I told this to one guy and he said, are you, are you comparing milk to a herbicide? I said, no, no, it's not that at all. What we think is happening and nobody really knows, you're, you're feeding the microbes and the grass is growing thicker and better and it's just choking out the weeds. The weeds can't compete with the with the, uh, the grass that's growing in the soil that you sprayed with, uh, with milk. We also learned that your bricks level, that's the sugar content of the grass, went up. Where we sprayed milk, we found that, uh, in, in this was in summer of 2010, uh, June, July, and August, we were measuring where we sprayed the milk and normally the, the bricks level or the sugar content of the grass was about three points higher. Whatever it was, it didn't matter. Whether you're talking Johnson grass, fescue, archer grass, clover, the, the comparable grass where you 
spray the milk was about three points higher. Uh, let's go to the next one. I got pretty excited about the, the spraying of raw milk, and so I started checking around with other people, and, and they said, oh, you need to be spraying this and that and so on. And one thing that a lot of people recommended was molasses. Half a gallon an acre is what most people recommend. They recommend, if, a lot of people will say if you use more than a half a gallon, you'll, you'll give your uh, microbes in the soil such a surge that they will, they'll, they'll, uh, their numbers will increase, and then they won't have enough food to maintain that growth, and they'll die back. Well, I always thought, well, that's not good to, to do that, but I had a, a microbiologist tell me, well, you know, that's not really all that bad. So if, if you get this surge in growth and they do die back, the microbes are there for the other microbes to eat. So if, if you... If you get a book on microbes or go on the internet, you'll find out that this is really a very interesting thing. There's no way I could even hope to explain it to you today in a few minutes. It's, there's a, a book out called Teeming with Microbes. I read it two or three times. It's very interesting. I would suggest that you try to get a hold of that book. But uh, anyway, it's, it's something that you just keep working at and, and hopefully you can you pick up enough that you can feel comfortable trying to do some things around your farm. Liquid fish, I think is, is a, I think it definitely helps. It's, it's a little bit pricey, uh, four and a half to six dollars a gallon. Uh, a lot of people put on two or three gallons. I'm tight. I try to limit it to one. Uh, sea salt is another thing that, that I have thought that is a, uh, a real benefit. This is especially true for those in a, 40 to 60 inch rainfall environment, annual rainfall environment. Your soils have been leached and a lot of the minerals are gone. The sea salt will put it back in there. Coral calcium, that's pretty pricey too. That's $10 a, uh, an acre. Uh, so anyway, compost tea, that's free. If you know how to make compost and you've got good compost, if, if you run it through a brewer, uh, you can spray that on your soil and get a pretty good bang for the buck, I think, you know. So those are just some of the things that, that we do and have done in the last three years. Uh, I told you that, that the bricks levels are higher where, the, where we sprayed the raw milk. Let me show you something that we did last fall. Starting October 26th of last year, I went out to a field uh, and took some brick, tested the bricks, and the gr fescue tested 25 to 30. I, 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 I can't explain that. I don't know why it was that high. Napa Valley premium red grapes will only test 25. After a while, we'll go outside and test some grass that we brought up here. Coca-Cola will test 10 or 11. Mountain Dew about 13, maybe 14. So here's fescue last fall that tested one time only, 30. 25, or 26 to 29, every time we tested it, we, had it, we, we came up with fescue that tested 26 to 30. We also learned that you can look at the plant and determine whether it's going to test well or not. A good, healthy looking plant, nice green color, not a bunch of lesions on it, you know, not, not a bunch of dead particles. If it just looks like something that looks healthy, like, you know, you just kind of sense what a healthy plant looks like, you test that plant and it's going to test better than the, the old plant that looks kind of yellowish and not, you know, not a good color to it. So every time we picked a good plant last fall between October 26 and January 4, uh, we got the 25 to 30. I was flat on my back following back surgery on January 
third and fourth. Brandon, the young man here, went out on the 4th of January and took that BRICS test. And the, the morning before, it had gotten down. I don't remember exactly what I've got a record of it. So it was very, very cold, zero or thereabouts. And that grass still tested above 25 on the morning of January, uh, in the afternoon of January 4th. So fescue will hang in there with you. I, I, I don't know why or how. You know, there's, the government will spend a zillion dollars doing stuff that doesn't need to be done. But you ask them to spend a dollar to test something that makes sense for a farmer, and they're not going to spend that dollar. Now, that's the one time they're thrifty. But we ought to be running tests on this stuff to find out why fescue will do this, why will milk help, what does molasses do, what will liquid fish do. Um, I, I don't know, but I can tell you, last fall and winter, we had incredible BRICS levels. This year, following a, a drought that we all know about, our BRICS levels were down considerably. Oh, I, I uh, on that second bullet there, October 26, uh, what I didn't say here was that the worst fescue we saw last fall and winter was 21 and a half. We had nothing that would test below 21 and a half. This year, November 1, just yesterday, we barely got to that 21 and a half level. We had some 23s and some 17s, and I'll show you, uh, uh, I will show you those results in a minute. Uh, archer grass and white clover last year was roughly five points below the fescue. Now, that kind of flies in the face of what we think grass quality ought to be. I think we all think that, oh, clover is a whole lot better than fescue. Well, when you're looking at protein, you might be right. But when you're looking at energy, at least in the fall and the winter, that fescue is hard to beat. I think that, that shows you why fescue can be a great grass if you stockpile it and take your cows through the winter on it. Okay, the next one. Brandon pulled these samples. Uh, October 28, just three days ago, four days ago. Uh, on the left-hand side, you got the four different fields. If you'll come down three, you'll see the apple archer. That's the field that we sprayed the milk on back in 2010. The ridge field, the fourth one down, that's the one that last year had the bricks of 26 to 30 throughout the fall and winter. This year, we had three samples from that field 19, 20, and 22. So this is the best we could do this year. Uh, I don't know why, you know. Uh, I just don't know. Uh, let's go to the next slide. If you will talk to this gentleman up here in the front row, Greg Judy, there's a guy back there with a white hat on, Mark Bader, they'll tell you that you want to graze the top of the plant if you want the most energy. So we went out and measured our plants. The top two inches in, that, in the field that we call the pony field, the bricks there was 20 in the top two inches. We measured the middle part, 17. The bottom, 12, the bricks of 12. Now that tells you why if you let your cows eat the whole plant, that's why she's gonna be all pooping off a loose. You know, I mean, she's not getting the energy to keep that, that stool solid. But if you can, if you're in a position to let them graze just the tops, you're, you're going you're gonna to solve a lot of that looseness problem. This time of year, I don't know if you can do it. What we're doing is we're, they're going to eat it out of the ground or not. That, they're, what our cows are doing, they don't like fescue. They're, they're going to eat the clover and the archer grass out of the ground. So what we are doing is, is we feed them a bale of dry hay a day, and that seems to help. Uh, and I don't think it's a waste because all we're doing is extending our grass. So I, I think it's money well spent. I think, we're, I think our cows are getting a lot better 
uh, diet that way. Uh, but you can just see uh, any one of those, 23, 17, 13, 20, 16, 10, it's, it's consistent. Every time you, you work your way down that plant, you're losing energy. So if you need any more than that, I, I, if that doesn't convince you, I, I can't help you. Uh, let's go to the next one. Why was our bricks so much higher last fall than this fall? I don't know. Could it be something to do with the drought that we had? Maybe. Last fall, we were very, very dry. We got no rain in September and October. That grass, it was hard to get moisture out of the grass. This year, we got quite a bit of rain in, in uh, September and October. We had about a three-week dry spell after Isaac hit that I sure would have liked to have had a little bit more, but at least, you know, it was much more moisture this year than last year. The grass last year that we measured was mature. It was grass that, had, that we were saving for stockpile. Much of the grass that we measured this year is absolutely brand new. I mean, it has all come out of the ground in the last 60 days. We were so dry that when I turned the cows into fields that had grass, what they didn't eat, they broke off. I mean, it was bare, you know, pretty much bare soil, and, and sure, there was nothing standing. So when we first got our, when we got that rain from Isaac on uh, August 31, a zillion little seedlings started popping up, and that's much of what we measured here. So if you measure a, an immature piece of grass versus a mature piece of grass that's been growing for how many years, I don't know, keeps, you know, coming up, eating off, coming back up, eating off again. I suspect that might have something to do with it. Do I know that? No, that's just a guess. Um, let's go to the next one. Can you see the upper middle in particular, how the grass kind of, it, it just sparkles? Folks, I've never seen anything like this, and I don't know what the answer is. We sprayed, um, did we spray anything this year early in the spring? We didn't, okay. We didn't spray a single thing until September. But after September, we got after it pretty hard. I have not used much liquid fish in the past, but I bought a tote of liquid fish. That's 275 gallons. I bought it from Schaefer Fisheries over in Illinois, and I'm not pushing those guys. If you order it from Neptune's Harvest, which I've used in the past and is a good product, they don't have any. They ran out. Uh, Fisher, or Schaefer had it. They uh, preserved it in phosphoric acid. We all need phosphorus. I don't know whether phosphoric acid is a good thing to put on your soil or not, but it's probably as good or better than sulfuric acid. Those are your two choices. Uh, but the one thing that they do offer, for 50 cents a gallon, they will put liquid kelp in there. So we sprayed liquid kelp and, oh, sea salt and molasses and, help me, Brandon, what did I, did I missed something, I'm sure. But anyway, the grass absolutely looks phenomenal. Doesn't measure as well as last year's, I don't know why. We probably wouldn't have sprayed anything this fall had we not had uh, an extremely bad drought. But, you know, spraying helps. It's, and once again, I don't tell you that you ought to do it twice a year or every year or anything like that. I'm just telling you it'll help. If, if it makes sense economically, try it. But it, what it did for us it got our grass up there to the point where when we ran our cattle into a paddock, they, they, they knocked a lot of it to the ground, and I think that gave us the ground cover we needed and also provided our microbes with the food that they needed. Um, talking about microbes, let's go to this. This is information from uh, Texas A&M University. If you will look at the middle column, 
in a, a, a in an acre of they describe it as fertile soil. In one acre of fertile soil, there are between 300 and 3,000 pounds of bacteria per acre. Actinomycetes, and I, and I may mispronounce that because I don't even know what they are, 300 to 3,000. Fungi, 500 to 5,000 pounds. By the way, that's a picture of a Oh, that's bacteria. The bottom. Okay, we got another picture uh, uh, later. Protozoa, 50 to 200. Algae, 10 to 1,500. Total, 1,160 pounds to 12,700 pounds of microbes per acre. Now, think about that. That's an enormous, you know, that, that's got to be more than, that's about like your cow herd. But anyway, th there's a lot of life under that soil. I th it's hard for me to believe that Texas A&M is totally off base. However, having said that, most people will tell you that you've got between 1,000 and 3,000 pounds of microbes per acre. So whatever it is, there are a lot of them under there. They can do a lot of good. Uh, they loosen your soil. They, they store the nutrients in the soil. Fungi in particular go down into the soil and grab the nutrients and bring them back to the plants. Uh, this is an amazing thing, and I, I simply don't have the ability nor the time to try to even come close to explaining that today. But the fungi probably might be the most important of all the microbes, especially the mycorrhizal fungi. Let's go on the next one. This is a picture of it. Imagine a, a, a plant has 100 feet of roots. The mycorrhizal fungi will attach to that plant and have 1,000 feet of filaments out there. And, and I, I'm just throwing these numbers out. It varies from plant to plant and from type of uh, fungi and so on. But, but the mycorrhizal fungi will enormously expand the root system of the plant. It will make it much easier for the plant to get nutrients, and it'll also make it much easier for the plant to get uh, moisture. The, the mycorrhizal will store the moisture. The, the mycorrhizal fungi will store the, 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 the moisture and the nutrients and feed the plant as the plant calls for it. What's really interesting is that Fescue is, is a plant that works well with fungi. The fescue gives off a sugar that the fungi needs, and in return, the fungi gives the, the uh, fescue plant the nutrients and the moisture it needs. And I read something about that just within the last 30 days. A lady from uh, South Dakota wrote a very interesting article in Acres USA. She said these to the fescue plant, or just the plant. A, a plant and the fungi have a, a, a system of checks and balances. The, the, the plant will give sugar to the fungi only if the fungi is bringing back to the plant what it wants. And, and, and she went on to say that these two have a metering system where they meter the, what it is that they want, and that it's very difficult for the one to cheat on the other. I, I just thought that was a wonderful way to explain that. Okay, what do we got next? Uh, a young man from uh, Georgia sent me the three photos, actually. Let's, let's go down real quick and then back up. All right, let's go back to the high density. Something that I've been interested in is making some savannas, and I got a whole lot more interested in it this year than, than I've been in the past because we've got 500 acres of woods and 300 acres of pasture, so I saw all those 500 acres sitting out there not doing me much good this drought season. And if I could get in there and thin some of those sprouts out and feed a little hay in there and let my cows get in there, 
hopefully I could come up with something that looked like that. I wouldn't graze it year round by any means. I only graze it once or twice a year. But I think those of you that have some wooded ground that's not too steep or, uh, you know, uh, some halfway decent soil, if it's, if, you know, if it's not terribly rocky, I think this could offer some real potential. We've got Oh, 100 acres at least, maybe 200 that would just be ideal. I'm 71 years old and I'm not going to get out there with my chainsaw and clear that, I guarantee you. But maybe if I could just do 10 acres, that'd be a lot. I, and I'm just curious as to how it would turn out. Okay, let's go down to the last. The, our ultimate goal is to have good grass for our cattle. We raise south poles. This is a picture of the cows, as you can see, with a poly wire. The next one is a, is a young bull calf. What we're trying to, we, the bull, there, right? okay, all right. <laughs> we had a, what we're trying to do as a breed is come up with 1,000 pound cows that'll produce, 1,000 or less that'll produce a 500 pound calf. I had a, had a picture on here of, of a, probably a 900 pound cow with her 350, 400 pound calf from two or three months ago. He's, he's, he's gonna make the grade. He'll, he'll be, he'll weigh over half his mom's weight. Okay, yeah, there he is. Uh, this little guy, I, I, I'm convinced, will weigh well over 50% of, of his mother's weight uh, come the end of this month when we wean. And we've got maybe six like that. We've got some great big old cows that we're trying to reduce the size of, but we're, we're slowly but surely getting there. What we're going to do now is go outside. If you want to take the bricks of grass, you need to do it between three and four. It, and in the winter, you probably, if, if, no later than three. Uh, in the summertime, you probably might want to wait till four with daylight savings time. But anyway, we picked some of that really pretty grass, and we'll take, out, take it outside and show you how we squeeze it. I will say this, uh, in 2010, uh, Greg Judy is a, is a very good friend. We've known him ever since he dumped a bunch of Red Angus cows on us a few years back. No. <laughs> what happened, Greg, Greg ran out of grass and we, uh, we came up and bought some cows from him and saw the South Poles and, and ended up with South Poles. But a few years later, we were headed out of grass, and Greg was kind enough to come down and take those cows back. So he, he ended up with the, with the same cows back, but they were good cows. I, I just like to tease Greg. But anyway, Greg has always said y you're, it makes sense to graze grass that's a little bit more mature. If you get around your farm every 21 days, that grass doesn't have much maturity. In 2010, oh, and, and another uh, theory of Greg's and it, it undoubtedly works. If you let the grass go without grazing it well into the growing season, mid-May, late May, June 15, whatever, you're going to control your weeds with that grass. Well back in 2010 we set aside about 30 acres and on the 7th of July, yeah that's right, we opened up the first of those 30 acres to our cows, and we had some, some very mature ryegrass in there, annual ryegrass. It was pretty, and the cows just loved it. And so I thought, wow, I'm going to sample this and see what the bricks level is. All of you know what a garlic press looks like. This is, how, this is one way to squeeze juice out of grass. Well, I squeezed that ryegrass and I measured the moisture that we got out of it, and it let it, the bricks level was five. Then I took a sample, and using a modified vice grip, you can see this after, after a while, after we go outside, you can squeeze grass in here, and if actually it'll do a, an even better job it, the second and third time, if you'll just keep squeezing it, it'll do almost as good as this thing. But 
with one squeeze, that ryegrass measured 10. I had just gotten this wheatgrass juicer. For those of you who are health food folks, you know what wheatgrass is and you know what wheatgrass juice is. It's a, I've never had any, but you know, people that do consume it think it's wonderful. And this is one way to make it. Uh, a lot of people grow their own wheatgrass and then stick it through something like this. Some of them have electric versions, but this is perfect for what we do. When we ran that ryegrass through this wheatgrass juicer, it tested, the moisture tested 14. Now, that tells you that just a straight squeeze, you're not getting all the nutrients out of the grass. And the thought that immediately came to mind is that old broken mouth cow. That's why she looks so bad at the end of the winter. She can't get anything out of that grass or the hay. She just simply doesn't have enough teeth left to break it up and, and get the nutrients out. But if she had, if her teeth were as good as this juicer, she'd look a whole lot better come March or April. But I, I just, there was no doubt in my mind that, that, that this is the equivalent of a, of a of the old broken mouth cow, the, the, wheat, the uh, garlic press is. Before we go outside, I'd be glad to try to answer any questions. If but, but w One thing I do want to say. Mark Bader has always recommended long, narrow paddocks is the way to get your grass to the ground and, and provide feed for your microbes. We've tried to install that into our program as much as possible. But I came across some guys down in southern Missouri at the uh, Beyond Organic Farm. Some of you guys may have heard about it. They've got eight or 9,000 acres down there. They have the longest, skinniest uh, paddocks I've ever heard of. They've got paddocks that are a half a mile long and 90 to 145 feet wide. Now, that's a long, narrow paddock. But they've also got some good grass down there. And they went through this past summer without feeding any hay. I wish I could say the same thing. But anyway, that, I, that's... That's it for my presentation today, other than going outside and uh, showing you a little bit about bricks. Any questions? Yes, ma'am. Uh, my question is, uh, you came in when you were talking about uh, spraying the raw metal. Yes. And you were talking about putting it on naturally. Would that work in a high country? The question, uh, the, the, the lady noticed, she got in late when she noticed that we were spraying and, and she thought we were spraying on an apple archer. That was where an apple orchard was. That's, that's what we call the apple orchard field. There are all kinds of people that spray citrus and apples and everything else. Now, I don't know if they use raw milk, but they use all kinds of different sprays. And I'm not talking about chemicals. I'm talking about natural things like compost tea. Would that work in a high tunnel? I, I would see no reason why it wouldn't. And I, I, I don't think there's any doubt that, that raw milk will help you. You know, and, and something as labor intensive as, as what you're going to do with produce, uh, you know, you could do that a lot. You know, two, three, four times a year, I think, would be beneficial to you. Yes. It, it, oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I, what you want to keep in mind is two gallons an acre. So if you're talking about one tomato plant, a teaspoon, you know, half a teaspoon, that's all in the world you'd need with, with, with a half a gallon of water or whatever, you know. Yeah. You know, it, 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 yeah, well, it, it, there is no ratio, ma'am. What you need to think is, th think in terms of how much milk you need to solve the problem that you're addressing. Uh, if you were to put, I would think, a tablespoon of raw milk in a gallon of water, you could, you know, you could take care of three, four, five tomato plants real easy, or you know, or even more. You'd want to spray the whole thing. Well, you know, 
milk's pretty cheap. You can go to a local dairy. Even now, the milk I use is conventional. If you go to a, a, a Mennonite farmer or an Amish farmer, and he'll and he'll sell you organic milk, I think it'd just be that much better. And if you wanted to put a half a gallon or a, a quart would be more than enough, I think. But if you wanted to put a half a gallon on your 30 by 70, that'd be, you know, I think I'd do a great job. Yes, John. The question is, what were the South Poles developed from? Basically, Red Angus, Hereford, uh, Centipole, and Barzona. The, the center pole and the Barzona add heat tolerance, and you guys know about the Red Angus and the Hereford. That's right, and a few, few short horns. Yeah, yeah, okay, okay. There's another gentleman here, yes sir? There's, there are very few government studies, but 70 years ago, a guy conducted a study on humans. Uh, TB, 70 years ago, was a huge problem. And this guy was out in California, and, and he used cats in his experiments. And he noticed after a while that the health of the cats went down. So he decided to see why the health of those cats went down so bad. And he fed them four different things. He fed them condensed milk, pasteurized milk, raw milk, and one other, one other farm, something like condensed. I can't remember what it was. And the cats that were fed the raw milk their health improved. The cats that were not fed the raw milk but were fed the other varieties, the pasteurized and so on, their health continued to deteriorate to the point where they became invalids, couldn't move. But the really interesting thing about that study is the guy had, you know, hundreds probably of cats in cages. And underneath the cat cages he had sand. And they, they saw that the manure and the urine that fell into the sand had a big impact on weeds later when they moved those cages outside. But the really dramatic growth came from the cages of the cats that were fed the raw milk. The cats that were fed the condensed milk and is evaporated milk, so I'm not sure what that other one is, but the pasteurized milk, very little weed growth. And then the guy went one step further. He, he planted beans. He planted uh, regular green beans in the sand. And where, where the, the, the sand from the cats that were fed the condensed milk and the pasteurized milk, those beans did poorly, very, very poorly. But where he planted the beans in the sand from the cats that had been fed the raw milk, the beans not only just exploded, they actually converted from the standard green bean that we know it back into the pole bean, which is where they came from to begin with. Now, if that doesn't convince you there's something special about raw milk, then I'm wasting my time. I'm not going to try to. That's the best, best example I could come up with. Yes, ma'am. One of the things you do, uh, it's an anoxin, you're going to plant beans, so you need to buy anoxin. But you can keep the soap in your water and don't mix it before you plant it. This lady said you can soak your beans in a, in a water and milk mix when you plant them. Do you do that? Okay. Uh, yeah. You know, 
I thought I was so smart. I came across this one article and I wrote a big story about raw milk and I thought, woo, I was the first one besides, this. well, Terry Gompert, the extension agent. And I thought, man, we've really got something here. Well, there's, there have been people that have been uh, growing pumpkins with, you know, with raw milk and it, it's a pretty common thing, you know, around the country. Okay. Yeah, I, I don't doubt that it that it'll, it'll control a lot of diseases, sir. You. Okay. Yeah. Here's another gentleman says he's been uh, spraying watermelon with. Uh, is that right? In Florida, when the uh, golf courses down there water their uh, gr not their greens but their fairways they put molasses and instead of a half a gallon like I've been told you should should be your maximum they use two gallons of molasses and that's the only fertilizer they use now I've, I would be interested in knowing if they get much weed control with that we we certainly get weed control but I don't know that it's the molasses yes question is or the opposite would uh, I guess a question would would uh, yogurt work better than raw milk I have no idea yeah yeah I know a man out in the panhandle of Texas that gets milk uh, colostrum milk and he gets it for 50 cents a gallon and he sprays it through his uh, what do you call the, uh, the center pivot and he just gets some enormous his bricks just goes through the roof. His cattle gain five and ten pounds a day. But the interesting thing is that old soil of theirs has had everything leached out of it from being irrigated all these years. The minute he stops putting milk on the, in, into the irrigation system, the bricks tumbles and the 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 way to gain of the the rate of gain of the cattle just goes all to hell. So he's got to keep pumping. Uh, that milk to feed the microbes, I would assume, that are what few microbes are left in that sandy soil. Now, that's a guess. Nobody knows because the government won't spend any money to find out the good stuff. Yes? I'm not sure I could handle goats. 